Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The conference is about to begin. We do provide simultaneous interpretation services. For those who have already got the handset, please plug the headphones into the device before turning it on. Channel 1 is Cantonese to English, and Channel 2 is English to Cantonese. Please wear your SI headset if you find it necessary. And for those who wish to register CPD points for today's conference, please find the CPD forms at the reception counter. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Conference on Safeguarding Children's Best Interests, Translating Policies into Local Practices, Combating Violence Against Children. This conference is co-organized by Center for Comparative and Public Law, Faculty of Law, the University of Hong Kong, and Plan International Hong Kong. I am Mingmi Young, a PCLL graduate of HKU and MC for today's conference. First of all, Thank you for joining us together with international and local experts on children's issue this lovely Saturday morning to explore how Hong Kong can incorporate international best practices pertaining to the Child Rights Impact Assessment Framework, the research initiative we're going to launch today, into the local context. This conference would not be possible without the joint effort of Plan International Hong Kong and Center for Comparative and Public Law. Plan International is one of the world's leading development organizations, specifically focusing on children, hoping to shape the world into one that advances children's rights and equalities for girls. Today, we are very honored to have Mr. Andrew Weir, MBE, Board Chairman, Plan International Hong Kong, to give us a welcoming address. Mr. Weir, please. Good morning, everybody, and it is a lovely morning. Uh, thank you very much for coming here today. Uh, Ms. Mikiko Atani, Professor Grenville Cross, Dr. Fernando Chung, Principal Researcher Puja Kapai, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome today. On behalf of the Board of Plan International in Hong Kong, as its chairman, it really is my privilege to welcome you here today for this conference. Thank you very much for coming to have a joint discussion how we together can realize children's best interests and make them visible in decision-making processes. Before I introduce more on today's occasion, may I take the opportunity to thank a number of people who've made a huge difference to bring us here today. It's of our great honor to have invited Mikiko Otani, the member of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, UNCRC, to be our keynote speaker today to share how global standards could be applied in the local context today. A very warm welcome to you. And what role a state's, state's children's commission, which of course is new in Hong Kong, should play to safeguard children's rights and best interests as stipulated under the UNCRC framework. It is truly our honor to have you here today. Thank you. It's also our great pleasure to host our Plan International global, global Human Rights Experts, Anne-Claire Block, fresh in from Geneva today, welcome. She is the Human Rights Advisor of Plan International United Nations Office in Geneva. And Rasa Sukulovic, who is the Head of Child Protection and Partnerships of Plan International Asia Regional Office, based in Hong Kong, uh, Bangkok. Both of you have come a long distance to support today and to share your expertise. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd also like to take this opportunity to extend our special gratitude to our partner, 
the Centre for Comparative and Public Law, the part of the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong, for co-organising the conference, with the tremendous contribution on the very pertinent research and the wonderful offer of this fantastic venue, we are able to get together today to kickstart the discussion for the sake of our children in Hong Kong. Thank you. Today is a special event. Not only have we gathered members of the Commission on Children and also enjoyed a very strong representation from both local and overseas delegates across different sectors, we have policymakers, academics, foundation funders, frontline service practitioners, and students spanning from legal, health, social welfare, pre-primary education, and other parts of the education sector. Real gratitude goes to our dear plenary speakers and panelists who are giving up their time on a Saturday and are professionals from across their sectors and real champions of children's right protection and contribute very significantly to various aspects of legal, policy, and practice reform over years. It really is our deep honor to have you here today and to host this conference. Thank you very much. May I just say a few words about Plan International? At Plan International Hong Kong, we think globally and act locally to safeguard children's rights. Originally operated as a field office, Plan International has resided in Hong Kong to provide support to nearly 12,000 children and families from the 1950s to the 1970s as a response to the critical child's rights issues arising from the influx of refugees at that time. In view of a later drastic improvement in Hong Kong's living standards, we divided, diverted our resources to other developing countries and decided to reopen the Hong Kong office in 2009. It's our ambition to make systemic change in child's right protection in Hong Kong in support of our global advocacy campaign, a priority we set in our new five-year strategic plan in Hong Kong, which brings us to here today. And just to give a bit of a background, since we've reopened our office, we've, we're now raising 70 million Hong Kong dollars a year for child issues and child projects in Hong Kong. And we're very proud of a number of ambassadors and former beneficiaries of PLAN who make a major contribution to our society. And we're very proud of PLAN that one of our greatest ambassadors and one of our greatest alumni is the current financial secretary of the Hong Kong government, Mr. Paul Chan, who's a wonderful supporter of us. So it's our purpose to strive for a just world that advances children's rights and equality for girls. We have a desire for all children to be safe, free from violence, and have their best interests safeguarded in all contexts. We are most delighted to know that a commission on Hong Kong has been set up in Hong Kong recently at the end of May, and we really look forward to supporting it, and we look forward to its function in formulating long-term strategies for the holistic development of children. It really is high time we have a comprehensive local discussion in Hong Kong on how to safeguard children's best interests and find the right mechanisms and frameworks to fulfill Hong Kong's obligations under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. So today we're so pleased that Pooja Kapai, the principal researcher who has led this research project wonderfully and has co-organized the conference, will introduce the Child Rights Impact Assessment Framework. And we hope that the discussion and findings will serve as a starting point for our exciting discussion on translating international best practice to something which really works for us locally in Hong Kong. Just to wrap up, there is an African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. What this really means is it takes an entire community of different people interacting with children, with the children best interest at heart in order for a child to experience and grow in a safe environment. And maybe we hold on to that last comment as we head into the discussions today. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for giving your time and let's have a great day together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weir. Another co-organizer for today's event, CCPL, is a nonprofit virtual research center in the Faculty of Law of HAU aiming to promote and advance knowledge of public law and human rights issues to the community. And we are honored to have Ms. Pooja Kapai, 
Associate Professor, Faculty of Law, the University of Hong Kong, to give us her welcoming remarks. Professor Kapai also serves as the convener of the Women's Studies Research Center and chairs the Equal Opportunity Committee's working group on gender identity, sexual orientation, and race. Her research expertise lies in international human rights law, in particular, equality law and minority rights. In 2012, Professor Kapai led a comparative study on children's rights education funded by the Hong Kong Committee for UNICEF. She also appeared before the UN Committee on the Rights of Child in 2013. She was recently awarded the Faculty's Knowledge Exchange Award the Faculty's Teaching Excellence Award, and the U.S. Secretary of State's Women of Courage Award, Hong Kong 2015. Everyone, Professor Kapai, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'd like to also add my thanks uh, to all of you for sparing your Saturday morning uh, to be here, and particularly to extend a very warm welcome to all of our international uh, guests, um, whom uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, and also to Professor Cross, uh, and many, many of you who are here from so many different sectors uh, that it really is a delight to be able to share our vision and our work with you um, this morning. Um, for my part, uh, I'd just like to share a little bit about the work that um, the Center for Comparative and Public Law has been doing. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Ms. Kelly Loper, who's the director of the CCPL for her support uh, for this event and the work that we've been doing. Um, CCPL has four broad dimensions uh, of the work that it does and research in the area of public law and particularly human rights law uh, from a comparative perspective is one of its uh, core strengths. And it's been um, in Hong Kong for, uh, it's been established since 1994, and so it's had a long-standing practice of doing so. And more recently, uh, a lot of our research has been um, designed so that it can achieve an impact in the community. So research impact uh, is extremely important, and you know, academics are uh, coming out of their ivory towers, and we really hope that we can make the ideas and the recommendations that we um, design through or sort of um, collate through our research uh, by studying sort of practices uh, locally, regionally, and internationally more grounded in real life uh, examples and practices to build and strengthen communities of practice. And that really is the objective of our work um, to bring everybody together because, as Andrew said with the African proverb, it really does take a village. And for all of us, we recognize that no single discipline has all the answers. No single approach can work, especially in a field that is as complex as it is when we're dealing with human beings and particularly when we're dealing with children. So I very much hope that as we share um, the work with you this morning and as we hear from different people that you think about your own um, disciplinary frames and uh, yet maintain an open mind to consider how can what we're hearing um, today sort of be integrated into our practice or what kind of shared language do we need to develop in order to make some of these principles hold to make them a reality. It's been far too long that we've simply signed off on international treaties and consider then that our work is done. No, that's where the work begins. And so today is really a starting point for this conversation of how do we embed our international human rights commitments into to our policies, our laws, but most importantly, not just leaving them on paper, how do we make them come alive into our day-to-day -day practice so that every child that we engage with in our work, whether we're lawyers or social workers or uh, medical practitioners, how can every child benefit uh, and be secure uh, in the full set of rights that has been, um, that is entitled to them by virtue of being um, children? It's also a very, very timely event. I hope that you'll all agree, given the establishment of the Ch uh, Commission on Children in Hong Kong, and particularly um, in light of the numerous cases that continue to come to light on a daily basis, almost, um, and in light of yesterday's news uh, with the half-year register of child abuse cases in Hong Kong. So really, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done, and we 
are very, very keen to working with all of you here to consider how we can translate international policies into the local context. Hong Kong has a very specific context, but it doesn't mean that we don't value these principles and rights. We do. We just have to find our own way to do it. So I welcome you all to um, generously share your feedback, your critique, uh, and your ideas so that we can strengthen um, the framework. And I'll just say at the outset, the framework that I'm presenting later on this morning, it's a starting point for a conversation. It's not a finalized version of any sort. It's a working draft. Uh, and so I really invite you all to uh, consider uh, and comment uh, in light of that. Thank you once again. Thank you, Professor Kapai. To express our gratitude to our guests of honors and plenary speakers who have come to support our event today, we'll now present souvenirs to them. First, may we now invite Mr. Weir to present souvenirs to Ms. Mikiko Otani, member, United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. Ms. Otani and Mr. Weir, please. Thank you, Ms. Otani. Mr. Weir, please remain on stage to present souvenir to Professor Ian Grenfell Cross, SBS QC SCJP, Honorary Consultant to the Child Protection Institute of Against Child Abuse, former chairman of the Committee on the Evidence of Children in Criminal Cases. Professor Cross, please. Thank you, Professor Cross and Mr. Weir. May Professor Kapla please come on stage to present souvenirs to Ms. Anne Claire Block, Human Rights Advisor, Plan International United Nations Office in Geneva. Professor Kapai and Ms. Block, please. Thank you, Ms. Block. <laughs> Professor Kapai, please remain on stage to help us present souvenir to Mr. Raza Zakirovich, Regional Head of Child Protection and Partnerships, Plan International Asia Regional Office. Thank you, Professor Kapai and Mr. Sokolovich. Please remain on stage. And uh, now may I also invite Professor Cross, Ms. Otani, Ms. Block, and Mr. Weir back on stage for a group photo. Guests, please. Thank you, guests. Please be seated. How can we miss out our audience when expressing our heartfelt appreciation to everyone who makes this conference happen? Hence, we will now have a big group photo with all of you. So um, please squeeze to the center, and I'll pass the next few minutes to our handsome photographer.
Uh, can our audience on the side please also join the center for the group photo? Thank you. Nowadays, we all need photos for Instagram, Facebook, all sorts of things. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. It's good that we don't have to do Snapchat filter as well. <laughs> well, now we'll play the opening video, Confronting Lived Realities, Child Rights Violations in Hong Kong and Its Impact. And we are very happy to have Dr. Kenny Siu Mei Kun, Chief Executive Officer, Plan International Hong Kong, to conduct this session for us. Dr. Xu has 30 years experience working in both corporate and non-governmental organization sector. Under her leadership, Plan International Hong Kong starts to develop local program and advocacy strategies in response to the alarming child protection issues in Hong Kong. She also launched development education programs to cultivate global citizenship in youth. Dr. Xu, please. Good morning, everyone. After Mr. Weir, Professor Kapai's introduction, I trust that all of you, like me, can't wait to go ahead with today's exciting program. But before we go on to today's uh, inspiring presentation and panel discussions, we'd like to start the conference with a teaser video re recently produced by Plan International Hong Kong. Child rights impact assessment is all about incorporating children's needs and interests into policy-making processes. By identifying, <laughs> by identifying every negative and positive impact and any policy may have on children, child rights impact assessment serves to ensure no child is left behind the policy making. And achieve this purpose, no way is better than listening to children themselves today. Last month, with the tremendous support for, of Alliance for Children Development Rights, we interviewed five children on what they fear most and what changes they would like to make to combat children, children abuses. Let's hear what they said. Why? 
So I'm not too sure how you feel after watching this video, but I feel both happy and sad. I'm on the one hand joyful to see that our children's energy is shown through these great decorative ideas and hope for this world. But on the other hand, it's heartbreaking to see how the world has again and again failed these children in protecting them from abuse. As shown in the video, the past two years, the past two years have been the most uncertain cases of child abuse in Hong Kong. And unfortunately, the news clip we just saw on the screen just, just the tip of the iceberg. A local research in 2011 estimated that 13% of children aged from 12 to 17 in Hong Kong had experienced child abuse and negligence, which amounts to about 120,000 cases a year. It saddens us to see so many children's development disrupted and the trust for the world shattered because of the abuses. The figures only remind us just how crucial it is for us to improve the existing safeguarding mechanisms to nurture protected, healthy, and happy children. We understand that there is a long way to go to develop a culture that supports children's rights as stated in the UN Convention. Luckily, we have some renowned experts today to help us in the process. I will now pass the mic to our MC of the day to further introduce today's program and speakers to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xu. We will now have our first keynote session today, 30 Years of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Global Standard in the Local Context Today. May I now invite Professor Kapai to come on stage and introduce our guest of honor for us. Professor Kapai, please. Thank you, Ming-Mi. Um, it really is such a great pleasure and an honor to introduce to you Ms. Mikiko Otani. Uh, she's an international human rights lawyer based in Tokyo, where, practicing, where she practices family law with a focus on women's and children's rights. She's also, as you all know, a member of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. She's a council member of the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute and the former chair of the Committee on International Human Rights of the Japan Federation of Bar Associations. She's also the country representative for the Family Law and Family Rights Section of Law Asia. The areas of her focus include human rights education, early childhood development, child participation, girl child, child marriage, human trafficking, and migrant children. She's a leading woman lawyer representing civil society in Japan. Among her numerous roles and accolades, um, Mikiko has been actively involved with civil society efforts in Japan and has also served as a regional council member of the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law, and Development from 2005 to 2014 and as a co-chair of the Women's Lawyers Interest Group of the International Bar Association in 2013 to 14. She's also active in academia, research, and teaching. She's held a number of visiting professorship positions in a range of jurisdictions and held training for lawyers in Cambodia, Mongolia, Iraq, Iran, Malaysia, uh, on numerous issues, including women's and children's rights. Um, Ms. Otani was also um, a member of the Tokyo, sorry, she was admitted to the Tokyo Bar Association in 1990, and her, she's also published widely in the range of areas that I've outlined above. So with such uh, an amazing array of areas that are pertinent to many of the discussions we're having today, I could not think of a better keynote speaker who could address us this morning. Please join me in warmly wel welcoming Mikiko. Thank you.
Good morning, and thank you, uh, Pooja, for such a kind, uh, warm introduction. I feel very at home here because I um, had an opportunity to speak uh, in this same hall, uh, I think in 2014. So um, I'm very happy um, to be with you this morning. And it's my great honor to be invited to provide a keynote address at this conference convened to discuss the very important topic of our common objective, safeguarding children's best interests translating policies into local practices, combating violence against children. I'm impressed by a large number of participation, which shows the strong interest in children's well-being among people in Hong Kong. This is very encouraging to see so many people working for children, working with children, in particular young people, including students, in this hall. I pay tribute uh, to the co-organizers, um, Plan International Hong Kong and the um, Center for Comparative uh, Public uh, Law uh, of the University of Hong Kong for organizing this conference. And I'm grateful uh, for being here with all of you this morning and humbled to share some of my thoughts. This year uh, marks the 70th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations General Assembly, as all of you may know. I think uh, it is appropriate uh, for me to start with some reflection on how the global standards of human rights have developed and at the United Nations and where we are now today in terms of the real impact of those standards on people on the ground. Of course, the focus of our discussion in the conference today is children. But I always carry those two books, actually. But this Convention on the Rights of the Child, the legal framework of the rights of the children, uh, the legal framework containing the internationally agreed global standards of the rights of the children has emerged and taken shape as a specialized human rights treaty for children from the promise in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The promise is that everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth therein without distinction of any kind. This promise did not exclude uh, children, of course, but it took four decades for the international community to specifically recognize that children have human rights by adopting this Convention on the Rights of the Child. Since then, another three decades have passed and we will celebrate the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the Convention next year, but how much how much we have accomplished our promise to the children that their rights are respected, protected, and fulfilled. This summer, I spent my own one week vacation. Um, Japanese are uh, well known uh, as a overworking, um, and I'm not the exception, uh, but I um, had the luck to take some one week vacation this summer, and I spent my one whole week vacation in reading the book, the book on the legislative history of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This book, published, published by Oxford University Press in 2013, is an excellent record of the drafting process of the historical document um, in over three thousand pages. Um, it's an um, amazing um, work uh, by Professor William Shabas. What I learned in particular from reading this book is the strong emphasis uh, put on the importance of the implementation measures. That's what I want to stress today, the importance of the implementation measures setting a common standard of human rights for all the people 
and creating implementation measures are inseparable components of the, this new regime of the international protection of human rights. This view was shared and firmly expressed by drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from the very beginning of the work of the United Nations. Protection of human rights will be only hollow, empty promise if it is not backed up by the effective implementation measures. With this fundamental conviction, the United Nations has developed and strengthened international human rights mechanisms for implementing measures. Core of those mechanisms are the United Nations human rights treaty bodies established to monitor the implementation of human rights treaties by the states that ratify the treaties. The Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1989. As one of such international human rights treaties equipped uh, with the international implementation measures by its monitor monitoring body, namely the Committee on the Rights of the Child. The convention is the formal recognition by the international community that children have human rights and the states bear legal obligation to realize the rights of children. If it, uh, it is a free and voluntary decision of the states to undertake such legal obligation by ratifying the convention. The Convention on the Rights of the Child has unprecedented record of the biggest number of state parties, 196 state parties today, close to achieving the universal ratification. Upon ratification, it is the responsibility of the state party to implement the international legal obligation under the convention in its jurisdiction. Realization of all rights in the convention for all children in the country can be possible only by state parties' conscious and continuing efforts and actions. Article 4 of the convention requires state parties to take all appropriate legislative, administrative, and other measures for implementation of the rights contained in the convention. The, this national implementation is the key. The committee, the convention's monitoring body, is composed of 18 members who are individual experts elected by state parties, and I am one of them. The task of the committee is to help state parties fulfill their obligations under the convention, and our main work is called reporting procedures. I, I'm sure that uh, some of you are familiar with uh, these reporting procedures. Under this pro procedure, the committee receives and examines the reports from the state parties every five years identifies the gaps and challenges in implementation and make recommendations. I think it is important that we all should be aware about how this reporting procedure works. The whole purpose of this procedure is to ensure the implementation of the convention by state parties. The international implementation measures does not mean that the United Nations human rights bodies, like our committee, come and implement human rights standards in each country, but rather what we do is to encourage, urge, and assist each country implement their international human rights obligations. So at the end of the day, it is the states who are responsible to realize human rights norms in its jurisdiction. This is why the United Nations started paying more attention to the national mechanisms 
for the implementation of human rights, such as independent national human rights institutions for the promotion and protection of human rights. The World Conference on Human Rights, held in 1993 in Vienna, reaffirmed the importance and constructive role played by national human rights institutions and encouraged the establishment and strengthening of national institutions. The Committee on the Rights of the Child has also encouraged state parties to establish an independent national human rights institution that includes a specific focus on children and acts as a national monitoring body for the implementation of the convention. In addition, the committee has also encouraged the state parties to establish a high level and cross-sectoral coordinating body given mandates of coordinating and monitoring all the activities related to the implementation of the convention. Coordination among all relevant government departments is essential for effective implementation of the convention as all children's rights have multi dimensions and interlinked each other. Cooperation between the government and the civil society in the country is another indispensable critical factor of the national implementation. Implementation is an obligation of state parties but needs to engage all sectors of society, including ch children themselves. The Committee on Another Treaty Body on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights once stated with regard to the protection of right to health. This committee said that all members of society, individuals, including health professionals, families, local communities, intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations, as well as the private business sector have responsibilities regarding the re realization of the right to health. Similarly, the Committee on the Rights of the Child stated that responsibilities to respect and ensure the rights of the children extend in practice beyond the state and state-controlled services and institutions to include children, parents, and wider families, other adults, and non-state services and organizations. I cannot reiterate the importance of national implementation more. Translating global standards such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the principles therein into local practices can be accomplished only by the national implementations with the strong sense of ownership and responsibilities shared among all people in the country. Integrating global standard into local practices can be achieved only by vigorous discussion, reflection, and actions involving all people for digesting and